in the air. And are we recording? We are. All right. So, hello, everyone. Glad to have a real live audience. Glad to have a real live council member and some real live park board members. This is the Spokane Park Board meeting of Thursday, October 13th, and we are starting the meeting. So, for roll call, it looks like we have a quorum. Myself, Bob Anderson, Jason's here. We have Nick, not yet. Greta, I believe we have. There she is. Oh, good, Christine. And, uh, of course, Sally and Jerry. Barb is on the phone. We will hope that Hannah can join us. Kevin Brownlee, Christina Verhuel, and, of course, Councilmember Bengal. And, of course, and so, uh, we do have a few additions and deletions to the agenda this, after <clears throat> this afternoon. Hello. Uh, from the consent agenda, Council member uh, and Park Board members, we're going to remove item number six. That is Western States capped. The Caterpillar excavator purchase, there's a little discrepancy between what was initially submitted to the committee and what the final invoice turned out to be, and we want to clarify that before we spend any money. So we're going to remove that and just table it until the next meeting. And then we're going to add, uh, in front of public comment, some clarifications by Jason Conley, who's sitting in for Garrett Jones today as our acting director of Parks and Rec. And uh, just some points of clarification on the dog parks. There were some misconceptions out there. We thought we should clear them up before public comment. So with that, Jason, I will give you the floor. Thank you, President Ogden. As we work through the agenda today, when we hit land committee, we're going to talk about dog parks. And I just wanted to, to mention these few facts. The City of Spokane Parks and Recreation heard from the community through a robust, award-winning outreach master plan last year that there, was a des that there is a strong desire by two-thirds of the community for more dog parks across all three districts in our city. In response, Spokane Parks conducted a citywide study and additional public survey to develop proposed guidelines to determine how sites are selected, designed, developed, and operated. The proposed dog park guidelines are slated for a park board vote later today. This document will be used as a reference in selecting and designing future dog parks in our city, but it does not determine the specific sites where dog parks will be built. The top potential dog park locations in each district are identified in the study based on the criteria and community values expressed through engagement of the master plan and dog park survey. In partnership with Spokane Public Schools, and I know that uh, there's a representative here today, Staff is performing community engagement opportunities of a potential dog park location in District 2 and District 2 alone that will be voted on later in the month of October during a special park board meeting and is separate from the vote today reg regarding the criteria. Mm. We've had two open houses this week. There are two more scheduled next week. And again, we, we thank the community for their strong involvement mm -hmm. in the future of dog parks <coughs> in Spokane. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. And we are happy to take public comment um, at this time. So let's see. We have Sam Mace. Sam. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to have public comment. I'm Sam Mace. Um, and I live in the East Central neighborhood. I live next to Underhill Park, and I'm here to speak on the dog park guidelines. And um, I'm here to really beg the uh, Parks Board to withhold endorsing these guidelines and step back, and we need to figure out a different process. Um, if there are guidelines, the guidelines are directly associated with the three sites that have been chosen for District 2, because that's what's punched out. All three of those sites are incredibly inadequate. They do not have the support of the dog park folks. They do not have the support of the neighborhood people. And I'm going to let some other folks here, I think um, another neighbor is here that can talk maybe more specifically to Underhill. But I will say to take what will ultimately be, although Parks is not saying that, one third of our park, our most treasured natural area, in a low-income neighborhood where our kids have very few opportunities to run on a dirt trail and play in wildflowers is not the best use of our park in East Central. 
especially when the folks that, it, it, you know, this whole thing has come about by trying to find a replacement for the South Hill Dog Park folks, and they don't even want to come down <laughs> to our neighborhood. They don't want the space either. And so why are we destroying this area that is so cherished and well used in our own neighborhood? But when I talk, what I want to talk about is the actual guidelines and the problems with those guidelines. Um, one thing is that they really do not reflect what the public said in the surveys in terms of the master plan or what was said in the dog park survey. Yes, people want dog parks. You say dogs and dog parks and there's no details. Everyone's like, yeah, all right, rainbows and unicorns. Um, I am a dog owner. I get, I fully support having dog parks. Uh, but in that master plan, when you look at the survey, people wanted dog parks, but that was second tier. And what was first tier was people wanted part, there were many other things that were first tier, but people wanted their natural areas protected. They wanted more natural areas. They wanted soft paths, you know, as opposed to pavement. And that scored higher than dog parks. And in our neighborhood, especially with the Benbird Trail paved, we've lost that soft path. So a lot of us have been kicked off that because we don't feel comfortable doing the shared use with the bikes. That's fine. It's a bike path now. But where we walk now is down in this area that is now going to be taken over for a dog park. And the second thing I want to say is even in the own dog park survey, 79% of the people said, yeah, we want dog parks. No, we don't want them in a natural area. And not just, you know, they didn't designate critical habitat, they said natural area. But two of the sites that have punched out in this whole dog park guidelines, two of them uh, have critical habitat. One is Hazel's Creek, uh, which has wetlands in it. Lincoln Park I'm less familiar with, but I know that has beautiful area, natural area. And then there's Underhill Park. Um, where we're not critical habitat, but in our low-income neighborhood, that's a natural area, right? We have wildflowers, we have birds, we have bees, we have walking paths, and it is our natural area and should be treated as such. And so these guidelines do not reflect what the public has asked for in either the master plan or in that dog park survey. Um, I would say in my professional career, I have worked a lot with landscape architects. I've worked with planners trying to figure out solutions for tough issues. And this has been a terrible process. Um, it was very clear that parks did not, they basically created these guidelines in an echo chamber with dog park consultants, South Hill dog park people, and I don't know who else, but I know for dang sure they did not check in with users in the existing parks. I'm the one that let South Hill Little League, like Spokane Little League, know this was happening, uh, right? Because they'll have a dog park right up behind the backstop. Does that sound like a great place that you want to go with your kids, right? <laughs> have a seven and a half acre dog park and all the barking and the smells and everything, right? They did not check in. In our park, I can just speak to Underhill, but in our park, we have Little League, we have rugby, we have the Pacific Islanders that have their events down there. Um, we have all kinds of uses that are all going to be affected by having 7.2 acres taken away. The thing, too, is that we are all being asked, we as the public and you as a board, are being asked to make a decision on October 24th before we have all the details. You're asked, we, we're all being asked to make a decision. I think you misunderstand the process. We're not making any decisions today on sites. No, I know that, but on the 24th you are, right? We've been told by parks that the parks board is going to decide on the site on the 24th. Well, I believe we have some meetings that are still scheduled. So, so um, anyway, I, I don't, let's not belabor that, but I'm just saying we cannot, they, but they want to break ground. They told us last night that they want to break ground in March. And that the stuff that has not been dealt with is parking issues. They have not dealt with public safety issues. They have not dealt with impacts on neighbors. And we're being asked to just trust parks that they're going to have this all figured out. And this way this whole process has gone has completely eroded public trust in our neighborhood with parks. Okay, so Sam, I'm going to push back on you a little bit there. I sat in on the uh, dog park uh, committee 
and we did in fact look at sites for parking. There were people from the dog park community on that committee, as well as park board members, as well as the Spokane Humane Society and other constituents, and they were looking at site possibilities. Somewhat like right. you look at ingredients for a recipe. The ingredients are there. We have to know what land is available, but no decisions have been made about Underhill or Lincoln, even though they show up on the list. They show up on that list as possibilities. Who was there from Underhill? Do you remember the person? Hmm, I don't. Nick, do you? We can get the name of individuals remember? who were there. All right. So not from Underhill, but from District 2. So here, I'll just give you an example from Underhill. I live right across from the park. We have many days in our, so what I'm coming from is it's very clear from the way that this was done is that park leadership doesn't spend, because they don't, they have busy lives. They're not down in those parks on a daily basis seeing how it's used. I'll just do parking and public safety as one example. We have a very narrow street. So they're talking about putting an Underhill dog park where the parking lot is at a dead end street. I live at the dead end of the street. And there's no parking on one side because when there's parking on both sides, it becomes a single lane street. And we're fine during when, when all these big events are going on, when Little League is going on, it's all illegal parking to accommodate it. And we're okay with that because we support Little League. Asking for what I think the term we used was 20 to 40 more cars down our street daily is too much. And I think about our, our fire hydrant is at the end, and we also have huge fire risk in our park. There have been summers where I've had to call in seven fires. They've required fire trucks. I think about oh, what, what are these fire trucks going to do coming down? We have a tiny parking lot that many nights is completely full. Just two nights ago, it was more than three quarters full. How is this going to accommodate a dog park? Parks Department is not being honest with our neighborhood about their plans there because they're saying, okay, now they figured out, because we have our treasured sledding hill there, and if you extend that parking lot out, it is going to be in front of the sledding hill. And that is going to cause a huge public protest. That is a generational loved thing in our neighborhood. Okay, so Sam, there's no dishonesty here. The process is not finished yet. So yeah. um, do you want to speak to anything on this or not at the moment? Well, All right. We want Nothing to express our concerns before I'm glad, it's finished. But be careful with your words because there's no dishonesty here. These people have worked hard in a very... Really? considerate way, full of integrity, with starting the process, okay. what are the possible sites? So that's where we are. Okay. And a list of criteria, which I think is very well thought out, um, and which I think serves as a model, frankly, for a lot of places in terms of, and met with the dog park community, many people from that community, uh, from the South Hill Dog Park folks as well. So I'm going to push back on you a little bit about some of your terminology, but Please, the process is not done yet, and we okay. are going to be listening to the neighbors at Underhill and Lincoln and other places. We're just not done. Now, well, we're, going to, we're going to move on to Can Michelle. I share just one story before I go? Yes. Uh, we were invited, a few of us, down to a small meeting with park leadership. And when we asked as they're talking about this and arguing with they were just trying to do a sell job, not actually listening to us, I asked Nick... Like, so, you know, families in our neighborhood are low income. They don't get taken out to Palisades. They don't get taken out to Riverside State Park. This is the place our kids in our neighborhood have to play. Yes. And when I asked him, what's going to happen to our families? They don't necessarily have two cars. They're working two jobs. It's nothing. When I asked Nick, and there's a witness here in the room that was there with me, asked him what our kids would do, he said, well, they can take a bus. They can take a bus. So and that is why right now our trust of the parks, and I've worked closely with the parks for 10 years because I live across it, is at the lowest it's ever been. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry that it's at the lowest it's ever been, but we gave you an opportunity to speak. Let's be careful with our words, all right? Um, let's see. Michelle. Thank you so much for letting me speak. And I know this process has been 
worked on very hard by all of you and Parks and, and everybody, and I appreciate all the effort everybody's done. But I've been listening to all the meetings, gone to all the meetings that I can, I've been listening to the public, and so I have a petition that I put out just asking how they felt our parks or the process has gone according to the guidelines that you have printed out. Mm -hmm. And I have 133 people right here in this book that have signed that felt that the, part, the areas that you have chosen, three areas, have not met those guidelines. Okay. And that's what their concern is. All right. Then they're asked to, it seems like they're being asked to vote on what kind of car they want to drive without, with just the color and the shape of the car. Well, you know, again, we don't not have, to the voting part, so. Right, but I mean, for our meetings, the meetings that we went to when they had to put the dots on the parks that they wanted, mm -hmm. that's what I meant by okay. they're ask, being asked to vote on which parks they would choose. You know, you have one, two, or three choices. Okay. And most, uh, quite a few of the people that I spoke to or saw at these meetings only chose the red dots to say no. They didn't really want to choose a dot to say yes. They didn't want to choose a dot to say they want, what their second choice was. Most people wanted to have no choices because they really did not want any of the three locations. And that's what the 133 people that I have here, and there are more petitions out there that we haven't gotten back yet. Do you have specific um, uh, issues or specific items that you want improved in the guidelines that these people were interested in? So where they felt that the guidelines didn't fit, can, is there specific feedback that we can get that we can look at? Well, most of it, analyze? a lot of it was, um, for most of the people I spoke with, was not it was taking away our natural area, okay. even though it's not a... Not a designated. Not a designated right. natural area, but it's our, it's our green space. It's where we come mm -hmm. to decompress. A lot of mm -hmm. people come there to decompress, to, just to walk in the woods, with and without their dogs, mm -hmm. with their children, without their children. They're feeling that if you fence that in, that would limit a lot of people's opportunities to be in that precious, yeah. precious area. And I have heard that as well from some people that have gotten to me personally and said, hey, I'm worried about this. Um, and I spoke with Garrett Jones, our Parks and Rec Director, about those concerns, because I'm also a tree hugger <laughs> and a birder. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that he and I talked about were the fact that since the dog parks haven't been specifically selected yet, and we still are getting public comment from the neighborhood, um, you know, we can take a look at things like, is the size something that we need to change? Right. Are the boundaries something that we need to morph Food. so that we protect bird habitat or what have you? Maybe we reduce it by two acres or something, you know. So it's not a done deal yet. No, we understand so that. So that's, that's helpful. Okay, and so more natural. Because I agree with you. I, I like the birds in the natural areas. And so. our concern, especially at Underhill, are some as how rugged the terrain are and how there are some rocks that are like actual cliffs that we're worried that if the dogs, you know what dogs are like, you get two or more together and they have no brains. And so our concern is that some dog is gonna go running off or get hurt. And then because it's so rugged and you have no sight lines, because if you're in one area and your dog is in another area, you have no direct sight lines to watch your pet. So in getting there so in a time, timely manner is a concern. Okay. And another one is if People don't pick up after their dogs in a flat, grassy area. They're not going to be picking it up in the rocky, rough terrain. And okay, applying sawdust or whatever up there is not going to help, especially during fire season. There has not been a year, there's not been a single year in the 30 years I've lived there that we have not had one or more fires in that area. And when the fireman came this last time, I spoke to him, because we had two just a couple weeks ago, I said, oh, what would you do if this was fenced? And he said, well, you know, that's what bolt cutters are for. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, it would take valuable time. Yeah. And yeah. fighting a fire, time is of the essence. Okay. And that's a huge concern for those of us that live right next to that ridge. Okay. And so, so these are constructive, useful comments that we can take back to review the guidelines and, and be critical in our thinking about those things. So thank you. Okay. okay. Um, if you have more, write them down, send them down, and send them in an email to us, would you? Those specifics? Okay. Yeah. And my husband did send an email to, the, to Garrett and Nick, and I sent one to, the, to, I can't remember who now, stating some of the ways that these parks are not meeting the guidelines. Okay. 
but right. I will be glad to send another one. Can I yeah. send Would it? you send it to me? I will be happy J.M. To. Ogden at spokanecity.org. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Now we have Kelly Brown. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I am wearing my hat right now as a runner and an early morning park user seven days a week. Um, and I'm speaking um, on behalf of my 100 member female running team, the Spokane Swifts. And we are strongly in favor of the proposed amendment to park rules, giving the police the tools they need to address suspicious situations. Um, in no way making um, the rules more stringent, it would not affect us using the park in the morning. In fact, it would give us an added layer of peace and security, um, knowing that when we're there, uh, there's safety. So. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I had no idea there was something called Spokane Swifts. Mm -hmm. So yep. <laughs> there's always more to learn at Park mm, Thanks, Kelly. All right. Okay. Any other public comment? Hearing none, we'll move on. So park board members, you have in front of you a consent agenda with now seven items rather than eight. We have removed, again, item number six with the Caterpillar uh, for later. So do I hear any other park board members who wish to have an item removed from consent for discussion? If not, I will make a motion that the seven remaining consent agenda items be approved as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. Go ahead. Several seconds. Yep. Great. Uh, so any further discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda as presented signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Oh, and there's Hannah. Great. Just in time for voting. Uh, opposed? All right. That consent agenda passes. Now we have a special guest, Mary Gilmore, past regent of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> Where have I met you before? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Okay, trying to remember what I had to do here to tech support. There, okay. There we go. There you go. And then from beginning. Okay. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Um, Oops, what happened there? Mm -mm. Hang on. Katie. Katie to the rescue. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, put okay um, I think maybe I accidentally selected that. Okay. Oops. Oops. So I can go. There we go. Thank you. You might have to stand here. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name's Mary Gilmore, and I'm the past regent of the Daughters of the American Revolution mm -hmm. Esther Reed chapter here in Spokane. And our current regent is joining me back there in the second row. That's Christine Olson. And I'm here to award the Urban Forestry Division of the uh, City of Spokane Parks Department with our conservation award mm -hmm. and it is a national award that has gone up through the ranks and to give you a little bit of idea of what we stand for the Daughters of the American Revolution is a nonprofit organization and we're highly involved with um, patriotic um, conservation uh, all kinds of veteran issues and all kinds of different things. And our chapter is the oldest chapter in Spokane. We were established in uh, 1900 hmm. on June 14th. So we are considered the flag chapter of the state or uh, you know, of this area. So um, we attend certain patriotic events and this is the Fairfield hmm. Washington Flag Day Parade. Hmm. and. In 2021, we had all four chapters from Spokane attending, but we also have the Sons of the American Revolution and other groups. And in order to be a DAR member, you have to prove the lineage that you um, are directly descendant from a person that uh, served in the Revolutionary War, you know, whether it was furnishing supplies or actually uh, fought on the battlefield. Wow. 
We also do recognition of flag certificates for agencies and businesses. This just happens to be one uh, hot start, which is a mm. company that's been around yeah. for over 70 years out in the Spokane Valley. And uh, they have flown their flag for over 70 years. And so we recognize them. Um, you can see the mask, it was still during the COVID uh, timeframe for that um, patriotic um, you know, activity that they have. Closer to home, we do have a monument out in Manitou Park. It's a George Washington monument, mm -hmm. and it was established by the Estuary chapter in 1932. And um, when I became involved, I've been involved with DAR for the last 15 years, and the monument had been, you know, sorely, you know, just vandalism, and it was in a place that really didn't have a high um, visibility. So what we did as a chapter is did some fundraising and had that statue moved and placed across from your little um, cafe um, down below the, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the greenhouses and we restored it. Um, and we have different ceremonies out there. Generally every year, our Constitution Week, we will do a Consti Constitution Day there. So that's something that we do. And lastly, we have other different types of activities. I just put some pictures up there. We honor veterans. Um, up in the far right corner, we did you know, with the other chapters, we established 15 Never Forget Gardens for the World War I veterans, their 100th anniversary. We support the Vietnam veterans, and so we every year we do um, recognition of um, Vietnam veterans, community service, and then also some of the different patriotic activities. Lastly, the NSDAR, which stands for the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, that's where um, we had several of our members plus people of the community, uh, namely uh, Dr. Lynn Norby, his wife Janet Norby is one of our long-term residents and members of our chapter. And they suggested putting together an application to recognize the City of Spokane Urban Forestry Division on their conservation efforts that, that they have done over the last 24 years. Additionally, it was Colonel Vincent Trapp who wrote a, a you know, letter as a commendation. And I wanted to read just two little um, sentences that he wrote in the supporting documentation that was submitted to Washington, D.C. He said, it is my honor to nominate the City of Spokane Urban Forestry as a conservation medal winner. For the past 24 years, this agency, as a part of Spokane City, has been instrumental in educating the citizens to appreciate and protect our local trees. Protecting these trees, new planting of trees for the future are two small ways to keep Spokane a hospital, hospitable and welcoming city for current and future citizens. I am pleased to hear the DAR appreciates and encourages businesses and citizens with conservation programs and projects. Recognizing urban forestry as a winner is a superb way to show that. Um, I personally, um, my background is in horticulture. I was an urban horticulturist and forester in my early career. And so, uh, you know, living here in Spokane, I also recognize the value that you know, our parks have offered to the community. Dr. Janet Norby, um, she's up on the far left up there. Uh, her and her husband's health has been pretty compromised over the last few years, and especially with COVID. Um, they planted a tree in Corbin Park in remembrance of her niece. And then also we, we've had two other DAR members who have put commemorative memorial trees up in the Corbin Park. And we had several of our members out with the tree planting uh, this year as our uh, every October, it's our community service uh, month. So as an appreciation for the uh, efforts of your, uh, of your uh, team here, I have brought the national recognition that I wanted to give to Katie and her team. Um, it, again, this was submitted to our national uh, Daughters of the American Revolution and it was approved, it was submitted in October 2021, and it was approved in April of 2022. 
And so I would like to uh, present this to the uh, urban forestry um, group. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. And also, this is the pin for Thank you so, so much. And if you may, just stay here for one moment, and I'll uh -huh. invite our team up, and we'll do a quick okay. photo op um, with these. Uh. But I just want to say just really a huge thank you, thank you. Uh, to your organization and for coming and planting trees with us today. Yes. They came and planted trees with <laughs> yeah, us yeah. in West Central and we've been planting over the last three days and so we had a lot of fun <laughs> together and everyone was asking for more trees to plant so we're going to definitely invite Good them back to have. again. So. How do you like my PowerPoint? I found a tree one. <laughs> <laughs> perfect fit, perfect fit. So, and we certainly couldn't do this without the support of uh, our park board members and our city council and our city leaders who um, uh, really support us in everything that we do. So if you don't mind, can we do a really quick photo op with everyone, if you would come down? And oh then- Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And then, and then again, yeah, um, our amazing, amazing team. We have the best arborists working for the city of Spokane. You know, yeah. back when Lori Kinnear was championing Spokane's canopy getting to 30%, you know, I think the Urban Forestry Department really came to its own then and uh, took up that cause along with our good stop. support of our council, thank you for that, um, and, and has really pushed to <laughs> regard our city trees as urban assets and um, things that need protecting, and um, so when you see a tree, water it. If it looks thirsty, um, take care of our trees and um, give, it give it a drink. And um, you know, I think certainly during COVID, it became really apparent that, um, and with climate change, the trees add to the quality of our life in ways that are long term and um, that we don't always think about. We take them for granted. We walk by them all the time. We enjoy their shade on a hot day, but but they really are an asset in the city. And I think Spokane has done a good job of making that asset come to the forefront. Um, again, with the support of the council and the support of a great urban forestry department. So thank you, Katie, and all of you guys out there with your saws and your tree trimmers and your, your wisdom as to where not to cut, as well as where to cut. So, well done. Did you want to say anything, Jason? No? Well right. said, well said. All righty. So now, he's been waiting a long time. We have the financial report and the budget update. Yes, and I'm gonna go down all right. Here comes the rescue. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. So the file's on the desktop. You would think after two and a half years, we'd have all the technical issues taken care of, but there are always technical issues. Pop up and do that, so I'm not quite sure. Sorry. 
There we go, John. John for the rest. Right. How, many, how many park staff does it take? How many to park do? staff? <laughs> so this is how many park staff does it take to change a light bulb? But actually, it's to change the PowerPoint or to change the. I think I uh, I see a new training module in the future. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. It's not doing it. I know it's not weird. That makes me feel so much better. <laughs> When you're talking to your computer. Exactly. You know, you're sure. yeah. Well, no, we So we have Jason, what's it called? Four more. Uh, we have this it right here? That's it. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh. In training. Yes. Yes. Ha. Ah. Ha. There you go. Well done. Yeah. That's a promise. Well, done. Ah. well, let's hope it was worth the wait. Yes. My goodness. Of course it was. Oh, That's of right. course. Jason, we're ready. I'm here to defense. All right. Well, let's, well, great at the end. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Mark Buning is on special assignment. I'm here to give you the September financial report. Um, and spoiler alert, no surprises. September does trend very nicely and in line with the other months that we've had so far this year. As Mark has mentioned several, several times in the past when he gives these wonderful briefings, the current financials that you'll see on the slides are being compared to a budget based on a two-year prior average. And we know very well the last two years have been atypical. We're finally back into a somewhat normal year, and thus some of the numbers will jump off the page and shout out at you a little bit as we uh, begin to um, get back to what we're going to call the new normal. Um, also, this, these numbers will reflect the inflation that the United States of America and the world's experiencing, especially when it comes to expenditures on fuel, fertilizer, building materials, and temp seasonal later, labor. So. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, it was running so good, Fiona. <laughs> It's like playing a video game that's stuck. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, no questions on the financial report. It's wonderful, right? And thank you very much. This is the surest way Sounds a lot like when Mark gives it. Um, <laughs> at least, yeah. There ah. you go. Do you see that, where that little arrow is? There it is. Got her. Just stay put. <laughs> Graph one, here we go. We're going to talk about expenditures versus historical budget average. And what you're seeing here is a comparison of actual 2022 expenditures with the historical two-year average. Year-to-date expenditures are significantly more than budget average. But let's point out the fact that earlier in the year, we transfer, transferred a million three to fund 1950 with the thought that we were going to fund additional capital replacement and projects, and we've done so. When we factor out this million three transfer, 2022 expenditures are above the budget average by approximately 25% or 3.1 million, reflecting a more normal level of program activity that we would expect to see. This slide here shows our year-to-date revenues compared to the historical budget average. Actual revenues exceed the budget by 2.6 million or 25%. Compared to last year, last year, 2022 revenues exceed 2021 revenues by about $1.6 million. In this slide here, we see a comparison of year-to-date revenues and expenditures. We notice that total revenues exceed total expenditures by about $239,000 if the $1.3 million capital transfer is factored out, the year-to-date net revenue is approximately $450,000 less this year than this same time in 2021. 
before I move on to the golf fund, any questions from uh, here or on, on the WebEx? Very good. Yep. Moving on to the golf fund. In this slide that we see the expenditures are above the historical average by about 15%. Actual operate, operating expenditures are up about 132,000 over last year, again, reflecting the inflationary trends that I talked about a few minutes ago. Furthermore, the year-to-date debt service payments on our, on our golf loan used to upgrade our irrigation systems increased over 200,000 this year over last. And capital expenditures on necessary renovations are up about 250, 255,000 over this time from last year. This is a fun slide here because it's all the golf revenue. Actual, actual total revenues, including the facility improvement fee, are above the historical budget average by 190,000. Total revenues have caught up with last year and now exceed 2021 by about 220,000. The fun thing is when you compare revenues over expenditures and you include the, the monies that we're collecting for the facility improvement fee, golf is a million eight to the good year to date. Jerry? You're just Jerry is doing it. Oh, yeah. Team Thank is you, just Jerry. Star. Yeah, I tell you. <laughs> and about 100 and some people out there. Yeah. Plus. This final slide of the report is the chart of accounts for the Riverfront Park Bond. And the thing I'd call out is we started with a si little over $68 million through all the revenues that we, that we had available to us. And there's $29,210 that have not yet been encumbered to be spent. So congratulations okay. to the team. We're about okay. done. Yeah, the idea is to use it all up. <clears throat> Correct. So. Any questions on the financial report? Very good. I right. thank you. All right. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Thanks, Thanks for Jason. That. And it'll be approved by consensus, and we'll move on to the special discussion items. Actually, this is not an action item. Uh, it's simply an Im informational update included. Um, Fiona, did you want to say anything about your marketing? No. Nope, except you do a great job. You and Josh and your team, thank you. Um, appreciate all of the work that you all do to publicize what we do <clears throat> as a group. And so we'll move on to the committee reports. Kevin Brownlee, I know that Urban Forestry did not meet, but did you have anything you wanted to say? If we can get your face back up on the screen. I just said our next meeting will be November 1st at 4.15. Okay, thank you. All right, Jerry, one of two items was presented on the consent agenda, but take it away with golf. Well, I am hoping Mark Poyer's there. There you yes. are. There he is. Great. <laughs> He's key in Hi, this, Jerry. you know. Yes. Mark is our golf manager and is out in the field doing things continually. Uh, we're going to begin with two action items. However, the Downriver Roofing Project will be via consent agenda, and that has already been submitted and approved. So uh, Mark will be presenting uh, the 2023 recommended rates for golf uh, that will take place uh, as soon as we, of course, approve this. However, he'll go through uh, the whys and ifs and, and uh, the need for having this to, in fact, keep our golf courses in the wonderful state and condition they're in. Mark? Thank you, Jerry, and good afternoon, Park Board. Um, what I have uh, for your um, consideration today is the 2023 recommended rates. And what I did was broke, kind of broke it out into four main categories with uh, regular rates, uh, the player's pass that we offer and the rate schedule below it, loyalty pass and rates, our unlimited pass and miscellaneous rates. So basically what this, this recommendation entails is a dollar fee increase um, across the board. Um, so uh, with some exceptions and I'll go over that here. So in terms of our regular rates, dollar increase um, is proposed for our 18 hole pre-book, our 18 hole Monday through Sunday rate and our nine hole Monday through Sunday rate. Um, we have no changes uh, recommended for our junior rate, kind of staying true um, to our passion to promote junior golf and keep that affordable. No changes to sunset uh, rate, daily private card or annual private card. Moving on to our player's pass, um, there'll be no increase in the pass fee itself, but a dollar increase across the board on the fees collected with those passes. Um, loyalty pass rate, um, or excuse me, loyalty pass itself stays the, ch stays the same. And um, the two uh, 
uh, greens fees associated with that pass go up one dollar as well. Unlimited pass, um, again, the junior unlimited pass stays the same at a very affordable 250 bucks for the kiddos to come out and play. Um, the uh, adult unlimited and the senior unlimited go up by a hundred bucks because we thought, you know, uh, on average, uh, those individuals play about a hundred rounds a year. So that kind of stays true with our um, dollar increase theme. Um, moving on to miscellaneous rates, our 10 play pass will stay the same at $400 and our spousal, spousal add-on rate will go up by 50. And that is the recommended rate structure for 2023. All right. Very Any good. questions? Any questions, Park Board? Jerry, would you like to make the motion? Oh, okay. All right, I would like to move. I oh, do wait a minute. Christina does. Oops. Sorry, Christina. Okay, Christina. Sorry, thank you. Yes. I do have a question. So I'm curious, is the extra dollar, is there something specifically that that's tagged for? Is that just an inflationary cost increase? If you could explain question. just a little bit the why. Great question, Christina. That, that is to combat some of our inflationary costs um, of, of operation, exactly. Thank you. Any other questions before we begin? All right. All right. Um, I will make the motion to approve the 2023 golf fee increases as stated and presented by Mark Poirier. Is there a second? I'll second. Great, thank you, Council Member Bingle. Any further discussion or questions? All right, call for the question. All those in favor? All Aye. those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, opposed. Unanimously passes, well done. Well done. All right. All right, other information. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mark, very much for your input. Uh, the rest of our meeting, uh, covered the budgetary financials discussed for the remainder of the year. I would like to say with heartfelt thanks, all of our courses are in excellent, excellent condition, uh, but everyone now is preparing for the fall and the winter season. So here again, the other thing I would like to mention is special thanks to Urban Forestry for helping with the continual tree issues and removing and trimming. Uh, Downriver sprinkler installation is completed and hopefully performing as, as expected. I got a high five from Nick. <laughs> uh, Fiona shared the marketing report moving forward to 2023. Uh, one highlight, well, I have a couple of highlights, but one was a special event held since, that has not been held since 2009. And that was the Eastern Washington University Women's Golf and they played at Indian Canyon back in September, and it included over 60 players, including 10 universities. Hmm. And because Indian Canyon was in such great shape, they've decided to come back. Uh -huh. So they have already scheduled their 2023 back with us at the Canyon. Highlight for me yesterday, I was out visiting Qualchin, met with Mark Gardner. The course is in excellent condition, and of course it's beautiful and welcoming when you drive in. There's a bed of flowers and you go on up. The parking lot has already been resealed, so it's ready for winter. And then of course, we finally, with Mark's help, we got the uh, clubhouse painted. So that is ready for winter as well. So now it's my job just to make sure that we get our windows uh, taken care of before the snow blows. He also has a new chef who has been welcomed and he's going to be serving through the fall and winter months. Because remember, we're going to be simulating with golf at all of our courses. Uh, Mark is adding another simulator, so he's gonna have two. Uh, and I believe Ezzy has two as well. Um, this, the uh, cafe will be open Tuesdays through Sundays, I believe, and uh, they'll be serving from 11 to 7. So it'll be time for an evening uh, visit out at Qualchin for dinner. <laughs> uh, the other thing that he shared that I think is really interesting, and um, it's called Silver Tea Markers, 
And this experience for a shorter play, even though it's the same golf course, it all came about from a group of women who came down from Touchmark and really wanted to get back playing golf. So Qualchin now has accommodated that group of individuals, and I just thought it was really exciting. We did have a highlight uh, with a morning visitor when we had golf uh, on Tuesday. When we arrived, we, uh, thanks to the park ops, we were greeted by a friendly uh, individual, <laughs> if you can call him that, Mr. Sparkles. And I think it tied in with Halloween. Oh, oh. it was really kind of fun. Mm. But uh, we were able, and I would like to extend a, a special wish to uh, Miss Layla Hammond. She celebrated her very first birthday and was able to come in on WebEx and see us. Oh, very nice. So a uh, happy birthday to Layla and greet her sister uh, Zara for us as well. She's not going on a smucker's jar or anything. I don't think so. Golf. And she is absolutely darling, hmm. darling. So I just had to mention that with Nick here. Uh, November 8th, 8 o'clock, next meeting. Hope to see some of you there. Great. Thank you, Jerry. All right, land committee. We have a lot to talk about for land committee. Hello, Greta. Do Hi. Got to start out with three of our action items from land were presented on the consent agenda, but one of them, I believe, we moved off the agenda. So two of the five. Um, our next action item uh, from Land Committee is the resolution adopting the citywide dog park site selection, design, and operations guidelines, the no cost uh, resolution. And Nick, do you have a presentation for us? I do. And I'm just pulling it up real quick here. Okay. Thank you for having me, Nick Hammond, uh, Spokane Parks, your friendly neighborhood landscape architect. <laughs> and get this up to full screen and we'll get rolling. So in our 2021 Parks and Natural Lands Master Plan, of course, recently adopted by the board and council, thank you both, um, we did hear about a number of community needs and if one of those community needs is dog parks. We are not experts in dog parks yet, and so we saw a need to develop a citywide plan for what a dog park is, where they should go, what they should be like, how they should be maintained, et cetera. Really develop a roadmap for how to improve dog park facilities throughout our community. So this is the document that has done that. We started that work back in April with AHBL Incorporated, a landscape architect here locally, who's been able to support us and, and in partnership with Spokane Public Schools and our PAC as well. We did establish a project advisory committee full of uh, citizens, two citizens from each district, and subject matter experts. So that's a veterinarian, a friend of the South Hill Dog Park, Spokane Public Schools, City of Spokane Parks, of course the Park Board and Bob Anderson. And Humane Society, I believe, as well. Humane Society as well, yeah. yes, our service providers. So what we really started with here was what level of service should we be providing? I mean, how many dog parks do we need? What makes sense for the city of Spokane? We have one dog park per 115,000 people. Whoa. That's a lot of people per one dog park. That's a lot of poop to clean up in one location. So we really look at what are the national averages here, and we see that in the Pacific Northwest, we, we see an average of other, of other communities about our size of one park per every 26,000 people. So what we really see is a need for between three and nine total dog park facilities citywide and that the sizes of these facilities should be no smaller than an acre, but in many cases for regional facilities larger than seven acres. So size is a premium for these facilities. And upon our outreach, we really heard the need was to have one kind of marquee regional dog park in each of the three city council districts. So each district should have their own regional facility and then fill in with neighborhood facilities um, and in addition to that. And Nick, I understand that of the survey, 
results that you had? Over 1,150 people we did. responded to yeah. this dog park survey. We had, as a part of our survey feedback, and I'll go through some of that here in a minute, about 1,150 responses from the public. Of course, our PAC weighed in as well. And of course, our master plan survey that was done the year prior, which had over 3,000 responses. We see need for three different types of facilities, ultimately, the community facility being that seven plus acre sort of off-leash dog area experience, neighborhood facilities as well between one and seven acres, and then pocket parks, which we didn't really study in depth in this course, but a need for pocket parks in highly dense areas. So think downtown over by Brick West, you know, you've got a pocket park where someone has an apartment, they have a dog, they have a need to get out and let that dog go do its business. That's really where the pocket parks make sense. So then we applied this and said, we need to search every single city-owned property citywide. We're not gonna look for additional land at this point, but we're gonna see if we can maximize the use of existing city property that's owned. That's parks and general fund and all of our other, uh, <clears throat> all, our, all of our other portions of the city. So Nick, it wasn't just parks that we looked at, but vacant city property that Correct. wasn't doing anything. Yeah, yeah. and you'll see like, in the rankings that there are some that rank fairly highly that are supporting other uses right, right now. Right, like the top you know, water of the or whatever. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We started to look and see what of these sites are not appropriate. And really, those are designated conservation properties. If something's already designated for conservation, it, it's not appropriate for use as a dog park. If it's something designated as an arboretum or a golf course, or if it's less than a half an acre, you know, if it's an active waste facility, if it's got a primary other use that's consuming that need, if it's an airport, for example, out at Feltz Field, we don't want to have dogs running on a runway. It makes sense for us to exclude those. And then steep properties that are over a two to one slope. So if, if it's steep enough to hard, that it's hard to walk on, it's probably not going to make sense as a dog park. So every orange property you see on that graphic is a property that was excluded from this study as a result of those criteria. Then we started to apply dog park values that we heard from the public and from our pack. You know, really on the left here, you see that the size is the number one preference of our project advisory committee, including our veterinarian who says, the bigger the size, the less conflict you have between people and dogs, sort of makes sense, the less potential for injury and the, more, the, the higher quality the experience is going to ultimately be. Tree canopy was highly valued. Buffers from ad adjacent uses, really buffers from other active uses, other homes, not putting people and dogs in a position where they're gonna be in conflict is important. Protecting our critical, critical habitat areas, our wetlands, et cetera. Of course, we don't wanna damage our shoreline or, or any of those critical areas. And preserving other park uses. We don't wanna be taking out soccer fields to be putting in dog right. parks. So we right. don't wanna displace something we're already doing well to be able to accommodate this use. So if terrain at Lincoln Park is too steep, that would not be considered part of the dog park, correct? Correct. Okay. As would you know, other areas that are under active use. Right. We did hear similar but slightly different feedback from the community in that tree canopy was the number one priority. A little bit smaller facility was okay to a lot of the general survey responses. And we really think that came from, we would rather have maybe a little bit more if that means we can have something closer and it's not huge, we'd probably be okay with that. Something that's walkable and accessible and has utilities and parking nearby is important to the general public as well. So as we started to apply these filters, we came up with 42 potential properties citywide that could be suitable for a dog park. These then were run through a filter that was scoring by general location and site specific criteria. These were all scored and I can quickly go through these here. Really it's what you've heard so far. It's applying the community's priorities for their goals and values to a site to say which of these ranks higher, higher than others. So do they have area available? What are the surrounding uses? You know, if there's homes right next door, it's probably a lower ranking. Um, are, are there existing uses that would be displaced? Are there access to the street? Is there habitat? So as we roll all of that in, it starts to affect the score of any one particular site. Nick, yes, may I ask a question? Um, the parking, you know, we heard prior different things about parking. So are you focused on um, a certain number of cars per acreage or um, kind of help me with that? What we tend to see, there's really no good 
you know, nationwide planning standard for mm -hmm. how many car parks per acre of dog park. But what we see locally at some of our other regional facilities is a need to have between 20 and 30 car parks available at any given time, sort of peak use. Okay. So that's a fair amount of parking. Yeah, that mm -hmm. that's some of that can be accommodated off street, some of that can be accommodated on street. And I think okay. that would be consistent with Spokane Public Schools experience. I think between 15, 20 cars at any time. Yeah. But that will need to be t Right. So yeah. that's the kind of thing that would be specifically looked at when we look at specific locations. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things in our current ranking criteria is if we have existing parking available that we could be mm -hmm. using for this sort of use, that would rank a, high, a site more desirably or, or like, higher than a site that doesn't say have any parking you know, now. For example, okay. Thornton Murphy has an in-park parking area. So, Correct. Yeah. So that may rank that higher okay. than others. Right. Okay. Thank you. We're going to just quickly go through each district and give you kind of the top four or top five of each. When we look at District 1, we found 11 potential sites. The top four sites, Upriver Park is actually a, a piece of city-owned land right on Upriver Drive that's undeveloped. It's next to Minnehaha. Mm -hmm. um, and it would represent a fantastic Dobb site if we were to pursue something in that location. Followed by, and that's represented in this sort of turquoise color. Mm -hmm. The turquoise color is your big community sites. The mm -hmm. green are what we would consider neighborhood sites, mm -hmm. so a little bit smaller. The other big blue site here, turquoise site, would be the North Hill Reservoir. Actually, it's providing a city reservoir for water service right now. It's fenced, it's natural, but it's not a conservation property, and that reservoir could serve as a fantastic dog park as well. Hmm. Something to note here is we have coordinated with all of our other city divisions, water departments, stormwater, et cetera. If they are not okay with us studying their site, they let us know. All so right. we would not show you the North Hill Reservoir if the water department was opposed to that use. So that homework has been done. Yes. Good. You also see Hillendale Park and Harmon Park as representing the other two top four within District 1. The Upriver site is the number two overall citywide site in terms of all districts. As we look at District 2, there's 16 potential sites, the top four being Underhill, Lincoln, Hazels Creek, and Thornton Murphy. Underhill is the number four rated site overall, so it's actually the lowest high-ranking site out of any district. That's mostly because District 1 and 3 have just bigger chunks of land available. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but it does represent an, a top <coughs> option for us in terms of a community site in consistency with the community values that we've heard. So a number of people have raised concerns about just birding and natural, even though it's not designated a natural area, natural areas in Underhill and Lincoln being something they want to preserve. So we can take a look at all four of these sites and review their ranking and mix it up a little bit if we think there's validity to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, this study is meant to be a guide right. for site selection and design of these spaces, but this study is not meant to be the all end all be all for which actually gets developed. And Hazel's so, Creek, you already had a meeting with the neighborhood on October 12th, right? We've yeah. had two neighborhood meetings when we talk about site specific. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily pertinent to this study, okay, right. but what we want to really have you understand is this is the starting point or guidebook for development. There is additional community outreach that is required right. to be able to say, mm -hmm. take this list and then really decide what are the top sites to be developed. So just to remind the public who are watching, October 18th is the neighborhood council meeting for the Lincoln Heights, <coughs> Lincoln Park site, and October 19th is the neighborhood council meeting for the Underhill site. So. Well, and let's be clear here, too. On the 18th, we'll be online at Zoom. On the Zoom. 19th, we'll be at the Liberty Park Library. Okay. And we're talking about all three potential sites at each, at each location. So it's just we want to get one, into each neighborhood. Mm -hmm. come. Good. Yep. Good. Uh, quickly, Nick, so far have you had, you know, fairly good attendance? We've had, on average, about 50 at oh. each of our open houses. Okay. So the first open house, I think, was about 60, and the second was about 42, 43. Good attendance. Good. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that because of the presentation we had earlier. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, are people really coming and giving their opinions? People are passionate about dog parks in one way or, <laughs> one the, way other. or the other. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about right. that. We're yeah. getting great engagement, great. more than we would typically get on, you know, sort of a, a park improvement project. Good. All right. Thank you. So District 3. 
of the three districts, it has 13 potential dog park sites. It does have the number one and number three ranked overall site. Um, you see the north side landfill, which is right up here. And a portion of that landfill is actually never developed as landfill. It's not actually holding garbage. It's just undeveloped natural land that is within the fenced area of the landfill. And so that represents a fantastic opportunity for a big dog site, That's 20 wonderful. plus acres. Mm -hmm. Wow. As well as the five mile reservoir. And if you notice this list, the top two sites here are not parks. No. Yes. So this allows us to potentially preserve our natural land while providing a natural feeling experience for the dog park uh -oh. user mm -hmm. at really pretty little expense. Excellent. So that's district three. You can't read these, but this is the ranked <laughs> list. <laughs> we do that on purpose. No, I'm just kidding. Um, in your, in your document, you will be able to read this list. We did rank and, and rate every single of the 43 sites in order. That does not mean they need to be built in that order. That just means they're the most or least compliant with what we see as our dog park values. Hmm. Again, we have coordinated with the community through public survey and through our project advisory committee. We've coordinated with other city divisions to say what sites are on the table and off the table in terms of availability potentially. Hmm. And we have vetted this through our consultant. We have a number of design guidelines that have been established. Really right now we're focused on site selection, so I won't bore you with all those guidelines, but we have some great information in there on site features and design features that would be applied to any particular site that we would eventually pursue for development. We also look at O&M guidelines to provide some baseline information for our operations staff and for the general public in terms of what level of service should we be maintaining these facilities mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. you know, how, how frequently should we, we be maintaining them and, and how mm -hmm. should we do that? How might we pursue volunteer efforts? Because mm -hmm. dog parks have really been supported by the community more right. so than by parks. Right. You look at the Friends of South Hill Dog Park, that park was run completely by a volunteer group yeah, without they, any city support. They so, picked up and provided water and picnic tables and food for each other. It was amazing. There, mm -hmm. is, there is tremendous opportunity for partnership between yes. the government and between these friends of groups. So yeah. this, is, this is an opportunity we wanted to capture in this document. So when we look at adoption and what we're asking the park board for today, what we see is that dog parks are one of the fastest growing amenities in parks nationwide. We see that this study meets plan, <clears throat> park plan goal B, objective one, which recommended the study of dog parks citywide. We also have an existing MOU with Spokane Public Schools for the completion of such a study by the end of this month. Hmm. That was a part of our agreement this February. We, we have substantial public feedback and PAC input to date, over a thousand survey responses and several mm -hmm. project advisory committee meetings. And a reminder here that adoption does not determine the location for the official South Hill Dog Park. That will be a separate item. This adoption really is providing background for future dog park development citywide. At no point in this document does it reference the official South Hill or unofficial South Hill Dog Park. This is really about citywide. This is the baseline study that we are pursuing for a basis for future work. Yeah. So here is our schedule. We are hoping and asking for adoption of this document today from the Park Board. We are actively engaged in public open houses, two this week and two next, regarding the official South Hill Dog Park specifically. And then we look to come back to you in this special Park Board meeting later this month with a recommendation on that site. So Nick, is there any reason why we couldn't push that adoption of this of the actual sites into the November Park Board meeting to allow for more public input or for more consideration of some of these concerns like the birding areas and the sight lines and the fire p potential just to make sure because um, October 25th is going to come up like a freight train. October 24th is coming quickly. 24th. Um, the Park Board can do as the Park Board so chooses. <laughs> I, I certainly don't want to tell you what to do. Uh, what I can say is that we are getting great public feedback and the first two public engagement events have given us relatively consistent feedback about which okay. site is preferred. Okay. I don't want to share that with you yet because we have more public engagement to do and I want to influence that. Okay. But I would say by middle of next week, we would know whether we felt we needed additional public outreach or not. Okay, so we'll okay. hold out the option 
Uh, we're not committing to the October end of the month meeting to decide on this, depending on what kind of feedback you get on the 18th and 19th. Yeah, let's continue okay. to seek that let's feedback and let's let that inform us. Yeah. I feel as staff today that if things are consistent with what we have heard so far, we would be prepared for an October 24th right. meeting. And let's, let's be clear here too, picking a site is the beginning of a project. Good point. There is additional feedback that happens when we design a facility to make sure we accommodate and address any of those risks and issues and comments we've heard during public outreach. So okay. we're going to the public early on this and often. That's often a challenge because we don't have fully baked ideas yet. Mm -hmm. And that can be a little bit messy. Like right? I said, the, these sites are part of the recipe ingredient list. They are yeah. not the final baked product. Correct. So, so really what we're here to do today is about that baseline study. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to follow up with the open house. And the idea there, Jennifer, is we have a study in a vacuum that's happening here at City Hall. Then we go to the public and we test those ideas. Are they any good? Are they, are they bad? Are they, you know, are they terrible? What do we like? What don't we like? And then we can provide you the full picture of what our technical consultant is saying mm -hmm. and what the public is saying. Right. Yeah. This is a good process. I mean, I, I realize there are others in the audience who feel differently, but I think that this process is excellent and provides a lot of opportunity for public feedback all along the way. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that you did your homework and touch base with other city departments to look at other land that isn't parkland mm -hmm. for dog parks. Sure. So that adds to what we can offer our citizens and doesn't take away from parks in those cases. That's so. correct. Good job. Any questions? No, I just think the main thing is to piggyback what Jennifer said, making sure that, you know, the public knows that we're in a process mm -hmm. so that we're just trying to digest, you know, whatever comes forward and really thanking the people that came today uh, to express their concerns. Looks like Greta, has Greta has her hand up. Yes, Greta. Hi, um, Nick, there's a couple things I'd like to have you address. Um, one is District 1, I think it even states its plan that District 1 has a greater need for a dog park than District 2. Um, also, the well, District 1 has the second rank site above District 2, which as we talked about, Underhill Park is the fourth rank site. Um, in the city, and there's a few other things in the plan about um, residents of District 2 prefer to relax and, and contemplate and meditate in city parks. Um, I think they prefer that over dog parks. So uh, I could explain why we're highly prioritizing putting a dog park in District 2 when um, it seems if you read the plan, District, other districts are, um, would, would jump out as a higher priority for dog parks. That's a great point, Greta, and I would give you the logic there. We see as park staff District 1 as being in the highest need for park improvements, especially amenities citywide. So there is significant need for District 1 to receive park improvements. The reason why well, and I would also say the study we're asking you to adopt today is looking citywide, not just at District 2 or District 1 or District 3. The action that would come to you in the next couple of weeks, or perhaps November, if you, depending on what we see from public feedback, is looking at District 2 specifically because of an agreement between Spokane Public Schools and Spokane Parks. As a part of the city's sale or, or, or trade of land to Spokane Public Schools in order to facilitate the Carla Pepperzak Middle School, mm. there was a commitment made by the city and by Spokane Public Schools to replace the unofficial South Hill Dog Park. And so the reason we're targeting District 2 right now, earlier, is because we have that need and we have a commitment by Spokane Public Schools to fund that improvement. And so that is why you see District 2 as a higher priority for us at this moment, because it's replacing something that was lost. I would say, if it were Spokane Parks, and we were funding this completely ourselves, District 1 would be the number one priority for us to improve a dog park. Yeah. And I would suggest that we, in our capital planning, um, pursue that. Good. Mm. Good, good. So, to be clear, 
to be clear, the unofficial dog park was not a fan park property or a park facility, correct? That's correct. It was public school so land. So we're kind of looking at taking, taking one of, some of our park property with respect to South Hill and using it to replace something that wasn't really ours in the first Yes, if you look at it as a one-for-one, one, you would be saying that the Spokane Park system would be providing an amenity that was provided not on Spokane Park's land. And I would also say there that that is consistent with what we heard in our park master plan. We did see community-wide desire for dog parks needing to be added as a part of our offerings in Spokane Parks. And so what we looked for is to use you know an opportunity, never waste a crisis, right? We had a... <laughs> We had a District 2 loss of an amenity that was never really an official thing, and this is our opportunity mm -hmm. to make it an official thing, and then to continue that momentum and potentially make it an official thing for other districts as well. So that was the logic behind the agreement between Spokane Public Schools and the Park Board, which was approved by the Board in February. Mm -hmm. Again, not on action item today, right? but that is the logic there. Just, I mean, has, has there been any consideration replacing the unofficial dog, South Hill Dog Park in a different district? No, there hasn't because it's just too far away. Uh, when we look at that site, say District 1 would be the number one ranked site citywide and getting folks from Moran Prairie to drive to North Indian Trail is not something we felt that we were able to accommodate reasonably. Okay, there were people mm -hmm. who drove from Idaho. That's true. For the South Hill Dog Park. So I think that's less of a concern. We have a, a member of the Spokane Public Schools here today. Um, is there any possibility of shifting that commitment to a different district? Or is that just not even in the possibility mix? Well, I think if you look back to the, the source of the MOU, it was... Sorry, can I interrupt? Would you mind coming up to the microphone so that the public could hear you as okay. well? So you knew if you showed up, I was going to ask you to speak mm -hmm. in some way. What an opportunity. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you, Greg. Hi, I'm, I'm Greg Forsyth. I'm the Director of Capital Projects for Spokane Public Schools. And to answer your question, I would say that the, that the MOU was written in a manner to replace the South Hill Dog Park. And the so reasonable solution is to keep it in that district, in that district okay. as it was stated. Okay. I just heard that question bubbling out there, so I thought it needed to be answered. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions? Oh, Greta, do you feel like your questions have been answered? Oh, sure, yeah. I, I think there'll be questions as we look into the particular selection, okay. but as far as the guidelines are concerned, my questions are okay. answered. Other park board members, especially those with dogs, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Anderson, Mr. Brownlee, uh, some, let's see, any others? Christina, do you have a dog? <laughs> Hannah, do you have a dog? <laughs> Any other park board members have questions? Mm. This is how we find out who has a mm -hmm. dog. Okay. Well, hearing no other questions, maybe we should go for a motion. Some... Did I hear something? I'll go ahead and move that uh, we approve the resolution adopting the citywide dog park site selected on an operation guidelines. And keep in mind that this is not the final site selection, and the, the guidelines do um, require additional uh, public feedback and input for, for site selection. Good. Do I have a second? Second. If that was a motion, I'll second. Okay. We, Congressmember <laughs> Bingle beat you to it, but thank you, Kevin, for your endorsement. All right. Oh, okay. Any further comments, questions? All right. Let's call for the question, Greta. I'll call for the question. All in favor, uh, say aye and uh, end or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, nay. I'm not hearing any nay. So it appears as though uh, the motion carries unanimously. All right. Thanks, Nick. Nick, thank, thank, you. thank you for your hard work. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Done. Nick. <laughs> and Doug. Uh, our next. Action item from a land committee the resolution declaring an endorsement by the City of Spokane Park Board to amend Spokane Municipal Code 
.06A, .040, and Jason Conley is on board to uh, present that amendment. Our resolution, <coughs> Jason. Thank you. We're, are you in the room? Thank you, Greta. Um, since my first attempt down there at the dais didn't, or off the dais at the podium didn't go so well, maybe I'll try it up here and see if it, <laughs> it's a little smoother this time. Um, this was briefed at land committee, and before we get started, just to, uh, to kind of re reframe this for everyone, where this started is the Spokane Police Department responded to several pretty high volatile critical incidents in our city parks this past summer. Mm -hmm. And when they were looking at the why and what they could do to prevent that from happening in future summers and, and even in the off season, they noticed something that was changed. And if you remember, we, uh, you as a park board, every so often are brought forth park rule changes for you to endorse before they go to city council. And city council is the actual governing body that has the authority to make the official change to the Spokane Municipal Code. But they loved, the council loves to have park board endorsement of any changes prior uh, to them co coming before them. The last time there was a change to the SMC related to park rules was July of 2021. In this case, when, when police were looking, they noticed that under our park hours, our parks have always been closed in the evenings. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., except for Riverfront Park, which closes at midnight. Makes sense being in the urban core. And they noticed that somehow when we made some changes in the past, we being board but ca probably council, somehow the change was made that if you're in the park during the closed hours right now, it, it was changed to an infraction. And for years and years and years, it was a misdemeanor. And in fact, I know that for a fact because my first uh, career with uh, Riverfront Park, uh, when I worked for the Parks Department, my first go around, uh, one of my last jobs, I was a, we, we didn't use park rangers back then, or park security officers. And I was actually a special commissioned park security officer. Mm -hmm. And I was able to write uh, s certain tickets. Mm -hmm. And I had two different ticket books. One ticket book, you would write a, an infraction and somebody would get a, uh, a fine. And, and a, an example of that is somebody that would throw litter in the park and you've warned them several times and finally you're tired giving them a warning so you write them a ticket and they, they pay the fine or they don't pay the fine. But then uh, the, the one that I remember more would be if, you would, if we would criminally trespass somebody and they would come back before they were welcome back in the park, I would issue them the misdemeanor ticket and that ticket came with a court date and they had to go to court. Hmm. But it also put in play a whole new set of rules that allowed for search incident to arrest. It, it put into play a Terry stop, which gives you the opportunity to pat somebody down in a frisk uh, to make sure that they're not carrying weapons. These are all things that can happen in a misdemeanor that could, could not happen for an infraction. So police in reviewing what happened this summer their, their desire is to have the park board endorse restoring the violation of being in the park during park hours as a misdemeanor. That's the change. Mm. Police will be the first to say they haven't issued. Right now, if you're in the park between 10 and 6, um, they could stop you and hand you a $536 ticket. I'm not aware of one stop ever. I never made one. Uh, they're, they're not going to, they, they have no desire to, uh, patrol is too busy, but what they want is a tool in their toolkit so that at 2 a.m. when they roll into a park and they see a bunch of people gathered and milling around and potentially up to no good, but they're not sure, they can go up and ask them to leave. If they refuse, they can place them under arrest. They can do all those things I just described and include giving them a court date. Under the infraction, they can't do anything. They can write them a ticket. Ticket probably goes in the garbage can on the way out or maybe even on the ground. And, and unfortunately, it doesn't have that same teeth. That, that's what we're at today. That is the one change that they're asking to be made. Um, and that is the resolution that's before you is an endorsement of changing 
a violation of park hours from an infraction to a misdemeanor. I can put that document up on the screen if you want to see it. Uh, it'll take me a few minutes in Fiona's help. Maybe John is, a, is a, you know, the, the three of us can show it up there. But that is the, um, that is the crux of today. I apologize. Um, I had uh, Captain Hendren of the Spokane Police Department to be with me today to answer any questions. Unfortunately, he is, he is quite ill and was not able to make it in today. All right. So, park board members, questions, concerns? Uh, I would just like to speak out as a uh, uh, resident of a home that sits on Cliff Drive. And uh, I can support every specific word that was <laughs> stated by you, Jason, and why we're turning things around. Uh, we, speaking from that neighborhood, feel the pain. We feel the incidents. Um, we are set up where it's a slap on the hand, they're gone for two hours, and they're back at night. So we have a three-ring circus that actually runs almost every night on Cliff and Stevens. So uh, as a patron and a park board member, uh, I totally support the police. Other comments? I would totally support this also. Um, I do have to admit I'm not normally a park user for that time of, of day, and, <laughs> and I'm definitely not a runner, so I, I wouldn't be concerned about that one. But it seems like the issue might be a matter of trust in what the police could do and what they will do. Um, as Jason said, it, you know, trusting on what was said, they're not looking to arrest or ticket someone who's running through the park, who's walking through the park. You know, I trust that they know the difference between someone that's doing that and maybe a collection of 10 or 12 people that are perhaps doing things that they shouldn't be. Um, I certainly like to see a, a stiffer fine so maybe we could prevent it, um, you know, as a park board member and as a member of the, of the community. I certainly want our parks to be safe you know, not just for me, but for, for anyone else that uses them. So again, I support it fully. So at first I was concerned about the fact that this looked like it was criminalizing, potentially, people who run through the park. Um, Kelly, would you mind coming back up to the microphone for a minute? You're gonna be my representative. I had no idea you were a member of the Spokane Swifts. That's very interesting. Um, what hours do you run through the parks? Uh, between 5.30 and 7 a.m. Okay, so this is not a call to the police to start looking for Kelly. But uh, have you ever been approached or given a ticket of any kind? Never. So did you even know you were committing an infraction if you were before 6? No, I would. it would have never been on my radar that I was doing something wrong. Okay, so your group, were they ever hassled or anything by anybody? Approached? Um, you mean... A by, member of the community? By, no, by a cop. Oh, no, never. Okay. So using you as a guinea pig, <laughs> um, the cops have obviously seen you and not cared because they could tell you were not up to bad things. You were a positive park user. Correct. So I changed my mind once I heard two things. Uh, one, um, that this was actually a restoration of what we used to have. This used to be a misdemeanor. We're going back to what we used to have. We are not creating something new. Uh, uh, and two, it occurred to me that if we don't get a lid on the violence that is escalating in our parks, nobody will use them. Uh, Kelly won't feel safe jogging through the park um, at five if it continues to increase in violence. We have got to stop this now. And anything, in my opinion, we can do to give the cops more teeth so that they can keep our parks safe for us, I'm in favor of. So I'm gonna vote yes. Other comments? Well, I would just like to say that, uh, speaking from the group uh, on Cliff Drive and Stevens Sumner in that particular area, this has been an uh, all neighborhood event trying to figure out a solution, if you will, and something that would provide us uh, some safety. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't that the people have not been working on this and the information that we have that's on record would be all the calls to crime check, which are now void. 
because we go right to 911. Mm. So I think there's a history there and uh, from that particular group. And I know that in the Cliff Cannon Neighborhood Watch that it entails far more than just our small little section of the world. Other park board members, other concerns, questions? Okay. Well, oh, Christine. I do, sorry, I just want, I, I do just want to express my concern about the significant legal difference between an infraction and a misdemeanor. I'm concerned about a misdemeanor being on somebody's record. It is, a, it is on your record for life which means that when employers are doing background checks, that will appear. And so I'm just a bit concerned about that level of um, infraction or a level of legal implications for folks, many of whom may not really be able to afford that to be on their background. Yeah. Well, again, Kelly has never been given a ticket, even though <clears throat> maybe she could have. Because, but we're not going to talk about where you were and when. Um, <laughs> Hannah, are, do you have your legal beagle hat on for a minute? Can you talk about the difference? Yeah, I think that Christina is right. There is a difference between a misdemeanor and an infraction, and a misdemeanor can be on somebody's record. There are options for getting that expunged from a record, depending on the circumstances. And depending on the court that you're in and the judge you're in front of, and whether or not they have a restorative justice mindset, sometimes there'll be leniency and they'll be uh, able to even get out of the misdemeanor charge before it's even actually made against them and, and goes on their record. So if you have a misdemeanor, you show up to court for the hearing and then the prosecutor and the public defender can negotiate it. And so in, in some circumstances, it might be that the cop has the ability to run the w search for warrants and arrest that person um, if they're creating a dangerous situation in the park. And then they have a charge of a misdemeanor and then they go to court, but there's no misdemeanor on their record because they aren't officially charged with it. Right. So I think Christina's point is fair and true. And in some situations, it might be that a misdemeanor for this ends up on somebody's record and it makes it difficult for them to get a job in the future. But, but I'd ultimately vote in favor of this because there's a lot of opportunities for a misdemeanor to not end up on somebody's record or if that's not the case, an employer, they have the discretion when they do look at the, somebody's record to see what the charge is and what it was for and to determine if that is something that's going to prohibit them from occupation at that That's job that they're applying for. So I think that, it, yeah, there's risks with it, but overall, um, I'd rather keep our parks safe and let the justice system do what it's going to do um, at the point when it's in front of them. Yeah. Because everybody's different. Every situation is going to be different for each person. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess the point I want to make about that is, first, the cop has to charge somebody with a misdemeanor. I mean, clearly, police have discretion. And clearly, we have evidences of runners, who shall be name nameless, um, who have been in our parks during the closed hours, going from point A to point B, exercising, who've never been approached by a cop and given even an infraction. So clearly, the cops are discerning who's a bad guy and who's not, and, and making that decision before they even take action. So I'm kind of like Bob. I trust that those professionals can tell the difference between somebody who's wholesome and somebody who's up to no good. Thank you, Kelly. You can sit down now. Thanks, Thanks for being our guinea pig. <laughs> Spokane Swift, so I'll have to look you up. All right. Um, other comments, concerns? I guess I'd, I'd ask uh, what the definition of a city park What definition of the city park would be anything owned by the Parks and Rec Department? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything so any that park owned park, park rules. Even though it doesn't have a date or anything that closes, is the city is the city park by our current definition? 
So she's asking. Well, the asking, other thing, oh, excuse me. I was going to say, so what Greta's asking, sorry, you were a little hard to, to hear. Okay, uh, but I think what you're asking is, does this mean any park land owned will have these hours and this possibility of misdemeanor rather than infraction? Yes. All, yes. all, the, all the park rules are, if it's a park land owned today, the park rules apply. Sure. And, the, okay. and, and if we make oh, the change. Um, just, this is, I'm just curious, when's the first time in the summer at our golf courses? I was just going to bring it up. Golf courses are golf courses park and rec. Are, yes, they're yes. governed by park rules. Uh, the, yes. the one difference to a golf course is it's fee-based, meaning um, to be out there playing golf, you have to pay a fee. Where right. um, to go kick a soccer ball uh, on, at Merkel, you may you not don't. have to uh, mm -hmm. during during non-rented hours. But yes, our golf courses fall under the same. We are under that umbrella. Is what's so important. Yes. Mm -hmm. All facilities that we have. Okay. Thanks, Susan. All right. Other questions? Well, Greta, are you ready to make a motion? Uh, yeah. Uh, I move that we approve the resolution to, uh, declaring an endorsement by the City of Spokane Park Board to amend Spokane Municipal Code 12.06A040. Is there a second? I second. Greta. I mean, Jerry. <laughs> the two Gs. Uh, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? In that okay. case, I will call for the question. All in favor? Uh, aye. Say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, um, CD, the single. Well, that motion passes. So the motion passes. Yes. Um, then the other items we discussed at the land committee, um, besides our action items, were Dick Hammond and a property owner presented a proposal uh, where the property owner was requesting an easement across some of some of our park property, which is a parcel near um, property that this, this person owns. And we discussed that and also the, uh, the importance of starting to work on our policy for how we handle these types of requests. And we further discussed a and and playground naming proposal. And we got a uh, report on the utilities and right-of-way agreement. And the next committee is November 2nd at 3.30 at the Sister City Conference room, room and also via WebEx. All right. Thank you, Greta. Okay, Sally, sure. Recreation Committee. Well, I'm going to be quick because <laughs> we didn't meet. <laughs> bless and you. our next meeting, what's that? I said bless you for being quick. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, November 2nd at 5.15. Okay, is Nick Sumner here? I was hoping he would be here. So, and unfortunately, I did not attend Riverfront Park Committee. Bob, did you attend? I did not. Oh, who attended? I did, and there's John. Oh, John did. Well, of course, John did. So, <laughs> thank you, and John, yes, for so holding the there. floor. Yeah. I was en route. Well, good afternoon. Um, so there will be a couple things to talk about today in, in Nick's absence. Uh, so uh, after I speak today, um, Barry Ellison will come up and also address the group on the Seeking Place updates. So that's going to be really fun. Uh, so here today I have an action item to present to you regarding the 2023 Riverfront Spokane fees and charges. I do this every year. Um, and the actual fees and charges are in your packet. I'm not going to show them on the board today, so I ask that you refer to those. But I want to address what the fees and charges are in a nutshell and what the changes would be. And then, of course, we start with the why. Um, inflation impacts are significant, as we all know right now. 
Uh, Specifically, uh, they're due to the minimum wage increases, uh, supplies of materials, but we also have uh, labor shortages, which is causing competitiveness in the market, increasing wages, uh, but also bargaining unit negotiated contracts uh, that are averaging between 5 to 7 percent increases right now. All those factors take into effect right now, and we I did a quick analysis of what the impact would be on our budget. Uh, as you know from uh, finance briefing that our net subsidy for Riverfront Park has increased about $135,000 on the proposed budget over last year. But generally what we're seeing right now at Riverfront Park is $433,000 increase between last year's adopted to this year's proposed budget uh, in just our expense categories. So we have a 10% increase on that. Our wages across the board are going up 17.5%. Um, and just for the attractions program, all the expenses associated with the attractions program has gone up about $146,000. So the fees and charges I'm going to present are mostly dealing with the attractions programs and the costs associated with that. But I'll also go over a little bit of the revenue, uh, excuse me, the venue fees. So the attractions, um, the proposed pricing adjustments will earn an extra $215,000 expected uh, over the 22. 22 budget. Uh, these pricing changes are directly associated with the cost of operations of those attractions, either the cost of labor or the cost of contracts. We have a lot of service providers for like, for example, the ice ribbon has uh, a service provider that maintains the mechanical equipment. Um, and then our cost of electricity goes up for maintaining the ice and so forth. Um, we also have a lot of contract expenses with the cost of the Skyride. And the Skyride has been showing a little bit more wear and tear as it gets older and needs a little bit more preventative maintenance than normal. All these factors increase the cost. Uh, but overall, our goal is to maintain affordability. Uh, that is key to what we want to provide to our community. We want the community to come down, use our services, enjoy their time with us. Uh, and so we want to keep our rates as competitive as possible. So the quick summary of um, the program is the ICE program, adults increasing by $2 uh, admissions, the child admission increasing by $1, uh, at Skyride, $2, a child, a dollar. These keep, these recover the cost specifically with those two programs, which are highly, highly expensive. Um, parking, I'm not recommending any fees and charges increase at this point. Um, one, our hourly rates are on par with what we're seeing downtown. Mm -hmm. Our early bird rate is below uh, where most of our neighboring lots are at. However, if we re increase our early bird rate specifically right now at the Lincoln lot, we will likely lose all our clients. They will just go 10 feet over to the next lot mm -hmm. and get the monthly pass, and then we will lose all that revenue. My expectation is that we should wait uh, until the Post Street Bridge is complete, that area of the park opens up, and then we reevaluate and reassess those conditions at that time. Mm. Uh, the carousel, also an expensive um, artwork to maintain. Yes. Uh, a lot mm. of um, a lot of work needs to be happen both on its mechanicalness, but also it's the horses need care, mm -hmm. uh, and that care costs money. And so, um, and we have operation, obviously, labor associated with that operation to run it. So we are advocating for a minor increase for a three dollar, uh, 25 cents, which would bring up the total cost for $3 and 25 cents. And then the daily rate uh, goes up to 95 cents. But essentially you can ride the carousel all you want for about $8 and 95 cents is what we're at. No, mm -hmm. sorry, excuse me, $7 and 95 cents. So really, still a really good bargain uh, on that. Uh, really quick, uh, event venues, we didn't change the pricing too much on event venues. The biggest notable one is we increase the pricing on the cost of the pavilion to bring it up a little bit higher because it is a very labor intensive uh, venue. Uh, mostly, most of our fee increases you'll see on there are associated with administrative moves. So one is uh, we're moving the Loof Plaza, for example, from the Loof Carousel section to the Rotary Fountain section on our pricing plan, and that just raised the pricing of the section. Uh, but really, we're not increasing the cost too much within those individual areas. 
The others are we really looked at the cost of maintenance uh, that it takes for some of our areas. So we want to recover the direct cost of both sales and maintenance of all the areas that we're renting. Uh, so we, we did the time analysis, looked at how much time we're putting into these areas, what it takes to recover from an event and so forth, and we made some minor adjustments to the rates based on those. Uh, not to increase it dramatically, but to make small corrections so that we can recover our, our costs. Um, and then finally, most, most of the changes in our venues are not uh, are, you're not going to see a big change increase, uh, primarily uh, to, I guess, the, the community events are not going to see a, a significant increase this year. Most of our community events have gone to a three-year, multi-year agreement with us, and so they're going to be, lo they're already locked into 2022 rates. So these are going to be primarily new events that are coming in uh, to the park that are going to be uh, subject to these fees. Uh, and then, of course, we off offer a lot of discounts, so no one ever pays rack rate. Um, at Riverfront. So um, finally, we are implementing a 15% uh, discount for private, non-profit uh, non events. Nice. These, these mm -hmm. are groups that want traditionally rent the carousel, for example, during the holidays, but it's not a fundraiser. It's for their own individual organization. Uh, and so this is, we've, we've talked with these organizations. This is something that's been requested. And so we're advocating for this discount uh, on top of the rack rates that you see in your packet. Yeah, so really publicize that because I think that's important to show that actually the price of something's going down. In this exactly. Economy. We are, we did decrease one price on yes. the list. And that so I'm sorry I missed the RFP meeting. Uh, what is the percentage for the room that you're removing the community events rate and what is the percentage you're using instead? Or does it depend on the size of the group? Or? We are using the same percentages. It, okay. So we did this intentionally over the last several years. Uh, our percentage for discounts have always matched our community event rate for the pavilion. We just broke it out separately. Uh, as we launched the pavilion and uh, so that our communities felt like they were given a better deal. Right. But really that percentage has always been the same. Okay. And so we're simplifying the rate structure, removing that category, but still applying the same percentage. Okay. Uh, and you're still going to get the same discount. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's it for fees and charges. Any questions? Okay. No? Well, in Nick's stead, I don't have the briefing paper in front of me, but I'm assuming that the language of the motion is something like adopting the tw 2023 Riverfront Park Spokane uh, fees. Uh, let me rephrase that. The 2023 Riverfront Spokane fees and changes as presented. Is that pretty much correct? That is almost verbatim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Experience. Okay. So that is the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? All right, uh, can we put the um, members of the park board back up on the screen so I can see their hands and faces? <laughs> Yay, there you are. All right, great. So all those in favor of adopting the Riverfront Spokane fees and changes as presented signify by saying aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Great. Opposed? All right. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Now, Barry. Good afternoon. Um, let me just pull this up one second. <laughs> I think it'll be hey, worth it. Oh, wait. Yeah. This is the fun part. Um, hmm. Maybe Can't raise the microphone a little bit so we can hear you better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just got to get back to the home screen, and I don't have my glasses on. Just a second. <laughs> <laughs> just you know that the, feeling. Yeah, to the um, desktop. Thank you, John. Welcome to the club. Yeah. Thank John, you, John. John, you have another full time job. <laughs> In the upper right-hand corner, yes. Thank you, John. And then if we can just share that on the WebEx. I don't have my glasses, I'm sorry. Tisk. Thank you, John. And then we can do a... I have, I have just a, qu a quick update for you on um, a signature art piece that was managed by... Uh, 
uh, Spokane Arts and, and, and the Parks Department, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in the construction management. I'm going to do this as a full screen. And what I want to, it's called The Seeking Place, and it's by a wonderful artist named Sarah Thompson Moore. And Sarah, uh, Sarah has this idea of, of celebrating um, our geology within uh, our area. And so she, she created this art piece that kind of rises up out of the earth um, and that has shapes and, and, and pieces to it that, uh, that harken back to our, um, what's underneath us and just brings that above ground. And this here is a photo of when we first broke ground, which was only about uh, six weeks ago mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the excavators out here. Um, and then Sarah and, and the group known as uh, Terra Bella, um, they came in to help out with the uh, uh, placement of sauna tubes and um, concrete footings and earthworks. And this is them working through the site um, in September. And there's Sarah. Uh, hands-on, uh, working on the uh, on the pieces. Um, that's her husband along with her as well. And it started to go up, and you can see how some of these shapes started to take, um, or, or how they started to take um, the, the, the form of, of basalt columnar uh, mm -hmm. stone. Um, and I'll show you some more here in just a second. And it's really uh, on a uh, cool site because it's, it's, it's right on this knoll that's just, just off the uh, U.S. Pavilion. And, and that uh, is a real special place. And uh, here's uh, Sarah and her husband unloading some, some other pieces um, uh, of this aluminum, aluminum that's in these shapes of, uh, of basalt, but also the perforated metal here um, in uh, customly done and, and, and very interesting, showing the different horizons, horizons of, of, of Earth. And th this is some of the work that um, uh, was going on there as it started to take shape. And I was um, following along quite diligently out there. Um, she also set basalt uh, benches hmm. uh, in, inside the uh, seeking place. And as we were um, working through um, uh, the earthworks, we were, you know, running into tree roots um, and had to work around that and had some creative, um, um, you know, negotiating to do there. But uh, you can see also some of the, as we were doing that work, we, we were mirroring other aspects that are in Riverfront Park, like our, our rockery uh, slopes that are in the, in, in the pathway at the, at the promenade. Of course, lots of beautiful uh, grass. And this is, this mm -hmm. is how it's shaped up now. Um, the grand opening is actually uh, on, on Tuesday at 5.30. Uh, October 18th, uh, we'll have a ribbon cutting. I think uh, uh, we'll Council, uh, President will be there. Uh, I, th I believe the mayor is going to come by too, and oh, I, I, hope, and I so. hope to see all of the uh, uh, park board members. Um, and it's 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 gonna wait till you see it at night because mm -hmm. that w we made sure uh, to have the grand opening in the evening. Good. Um, this is Grant off to the side there. You can uh, barely see his, his, his face for that wonderful beard. And um, he did all of the earthworks and, and, and the ground plane. And Sarah's there polishing up a few things. Um, she's a wonderful, uh, happy young lady. And it's, you can see how tall it is. Yeah. It's oh, It's, it's impressive. Mm -hmm. When you're up there, it's cool. And it really has a presence mm -hmm. uh, from the promenade. Um, it plays with light. Isn't it wonderful? Mm -hmm. It's this wonderful when something turns out better than you expected. Yes. It's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a shot in the early morning, and then, of course, oh. in the evening, oh, beautiful. Uh, the sun, the sunset, and how it um, uh, filters through the site. Uh, the real, the, oh, the real that. cool part too is is in the evening, yeah. and oh. uh, Sarah just lit it up. Wonderfully, it's really special. Yeah, that is. Um, here's another shot from the other side, looking back oh. into the park, and one of the um, things that we were concerned about during design with Sarah was its transparency. And as you can see in the evening, uh, Grant is is in there working, mm -hmm. and you can see him pretty easily. So um, I think that, that 
that exceeded our expectations too yes. from a safety oh, yeah. yes, standpoint. I didn't think it would be so see-through and it's mm. wonderful. That it's is a great. Oh, I'm so happy it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, like I said, it opens up uh, mm. on Tuesday. It's, uh, we'll tear down the fences and we'll give it, give it over to the park goers. Yes. and just couldn't be happier for Sarah mm -hmm. and, and yes. the city of Spokane. Well, thank you to thank Sarah you and Tara Bella and Spokane Arts and everybody who made this possible, of course, our own team. And um, gosh, it's wonderful. It's gorgeous. It's really wonderful when something, as I said, exceeds your expectations. Well, it was so exciting to see her and the hands-on. Yes. I mean, she was so in, you know, personally involved. Yes. Thank okay. you, Barry. Thank you. What a nice presentation. Mm. Can you top that, Bob, with finance? I don't think I even want to try. <laughs> Take it away. Finance wasn't terribly controversial, but we did meet Tuesday, October 11th at 3 p.m. in the hybrid format. We did have the one action item to approve and transmit to the city council and SBO for $300,000 to the golf fund. That was approved and sent to the board as part of the cons consent agenda. Um, that does also indicate that the operating expenses, which were a part of this, have increased significantly. Garrett Jones provided an update to the 2023 budget, highlighted by the change in the risk fund deficit payback. Um, this was certainly a concern of ours. And so Garrett, with the help of the city staff and so on, was able to get this from a single transfer in 2023 to a five-year annualized plan. And this helped reduce the planning, or the plan 2023 budget deficit from over $800,000 down to $164,818. So kudos to, to the entire staff for getting that down. It's much more manageable at 160 than it was at 800,000. Mark Bunig presented the September financials, which again illustrate increased revenues and expenses. Overall revenue over expenditures are about $1.4 million less than last year. And I know Jason touched on this earlier that a large portion of that approximately 1.2 million was a transfer of money from fund 1400 to the capital account. Uh, Riverfront park revenues led by increased event activity were actually up $809,000 over 2021. Then we also showed a considerable increase in our expenses. A special park board budget adoption meeting will be October 24th from 10 to 11, and that will be in hybrid format. And the next finance committee meeting is scheduled for November 9th at 3 p.m., again in a hybrid format. Thank you, Bob. And how about the DVC, Development and Volunteer? The DVC met Wednesday, September 21st at 3 p.m. in hybrid format also. Fiona Dixon presented a walkthrough of volunteer, adopt, and a friend's matrix, illustrating the different levels of parks supported community involvement. And the key here, I believe, is when we talk to groups in the past, we've talked about friends of parks. And that really involves more than maybe some groups are willing to do. So starting out as a volunteer, um, maybe then moving up to an adopt and then up to friends, but it's, it's a different level involvement at each stage. And at all three stages, the, the volunteers will receive the park support. So I think it's an excellent change that, that Parks has made. Garrett Jones and Rick Romero presented a Expo Plus 50 update. Garrett recapped the marketing team, which was hosted by Sp Greater Spokane Inc. and Visit Spokane. Their next meeting will focus on establishing event themes and an event beginning and ending time frame. And Garrett and Rick met with former Expo 74 planners who provided an input for 2024 celebration while stressing the need for a full-time employee to coordinate all the event activities. You know, what a great strength that is to get people that were involved with mm -hmm. planning of the Expo 50 years ago coming back to volunteer their time to help us again. Well, it tells you how significant that event was. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And Gonzaga University students from environmental sciences and the business programs will assist with plans for activating the Spokane River. 
And again, Spokane River activity was stressed within the master plan. And it's also been a, uh, certainly a part of the Expo 70, the Expo 50 plus. The meeting was adjourned at 3.51 p.m. The October meeting has been canceled. So the next scheduled meeting will be November 16th at 3 p.m. in hybrid format. And Kelly, if you will fill us in on the CAC portion. Third time's a charm. Yes. Thank you, Bob. Um, we met last month and we are grateful for Fiona Dixon and all her hard work in creating a Friends of Toolkit. And she's mm -hmm. just finishing up the final touches on that. And we will have it presented um, in November because we are canceling our October meeting. Um, that will be on November 17th. Um, we are also grateful to hear um, all the Expo 50 updates filtered down from the DVC to the CAC. So we look forward to being able to participate as needed in our own individual groups. Um, we've already found great use as a committee to um, be a sounding bar for each other and we're thankful for the support of Garrett Jones and Nick Kamad in helping the various group members move our projects along. Um, we already had one great presentation and we will have another one possibly coming up in November. Um, that's about it. We're grateful that we're working together and helping support each other. Well, we're very grateful mm -hmm. for yes. your work, Thanks, Kelly. Kelly. Thank you, Great Kelly. Job. Thanks. All right, very good. My only comment, since we are running late and I wanna keep it short on my part, is that um, we, I'm just reminding you all of the short park board meeting on October 24th at 10 o'clock. All right, we have no conservation futures since we have no Nick Sumner. Bob Ritchie, are you still here? Do you have anything from the Parks Foundation? I know that Yvonne has been in Germany with family. Oh. So nothing from Barb. Council Member Bingle has had to leave. Anything from you, Jason? I'll just add two very quick things. Um, a bit of good news, a surprise for everyone. The Merkel Field Turf Repair Project is way ahead of schedule. Oh, nice. Very In good. fact, we think we'll be able to take the construction fence down next week, which wow. will open it back up. And we are already starting to schedule bookings way earlier than thought. Um, so we were, we're going to bring that facility back online to the community. We're very, very tickled with that. Um, our fall recreation programs are having banner attendance. That's therapeutic rec. And also, we have 600 players signed up for our fall volleyball league. 600 players. That's a great That's number. That's a ton. Great number. And the last thing I'll mention, um, in Palisades Park, uh, there are still some privately owned parcels that kind of infill within that park. And as they become available, Park Board adopted a policy years ago that allows us as staff to go negotiate the uh, transaction we purchased two in the last month. And we're always keeping our eyes out for more. So those are quick parcels that probably were being used uh, by the public, but now they're in perpetuity belongs to Park and Rec. Excellent. Thank you. That's my Thanks, report. Jason. All right, so Barb Ritchie, I apologize, I went too quickly. You're still here and you tried to speak. And it sounds like the Parks Foundation didn't meet the funds balances in the packet, but Barb, did you wanna say anything else? Hmm. I think we're having some connection issues. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing her. But Barb, we appreciate the work you do with the Parks Foundation, bravo. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Barb. Right. <laughs> so. Hearing nothing else, she's trying to swish. I don't know what that means. Telephones. Oh. Oh. Okay, well, Barb. Okay, thank you. And I guess we're done. So I will adjourn the meeting at 5.33. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Good meeting today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank